This episode is sponsored by MSN. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa nasalli ala rasulihi al-Kareem. Jazakum Allah khairan for inviting me to speak in the month of Ramadan, a chance where we all can get many of the virtues and blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, one of these ways that we do is staying connected to the Qur'an as one of the reasons, the main virtues of the month of Ramadan is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an that he, the Qur'an was revealed in it. Unzila fihi al-Qur'an. And so the more attachment and connection we have with the Qur'an, we can be just as blessed as uh, the month of Ramadan because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says the virtue of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over all other words is like the virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over all of his creation. So we want to get as close as we can by reciting it, by understanding it, by reading it in our salat. We want to be like the Prophet ﷺ where he was the walking Qur'an. Uh, I'll be talking about the 22nd juz and although it starts in the middle of surahs here and there, we won't, uh, so we won't be able to talk about everything. And even in this short video, we're not going to be able to discuss every single topic within the, su- within the 22nd juz. But uh, we'll try to cover what we can so that we get at least uh, an idea of what the surahs are about. Now, the uh, the 22nd juz starts uh, in somewhere in the middle of Surah Al-Ahzab. And Surah Al-Ahzab speaks on uh, many of the social reforms uh, within Islam. Mainly, one of the main things that it talks about, first of all, is the Prophet ﷺ and his wives and uh, how they have a certain status within uh, the Ummah that nobody else can have. Um, some of the Prophet wasallam, he's given certain new ways that other people uh, do not have. And also the wives of the Prophet wasallam, their virtue is mentioned of how they have this opportunity to be uh, role models for everybody else. And in reality, they are Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. And because they have that category, one of the things Allah Subhanahu wa says to uh, the believers that nobody can try to marry the wives of the Prophet ﷺ after he has passed away. So there's aside from that, the Prophet ﷺ himself, Allah SWT is telling him that in Allahu malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi that even Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and uh, sends his blessings and the uh, angels send their salutation on the Prophet ﷺ then commanding all the believers to do so as well and in the surah also saying that he is the role model for everyone and because the Prophet ﷺ was the role model he was also used to uh, create the social reforms even if it was something that was against his liking like one of the uh, things that the Arab had is when they adopt a child they become just like their son but in Islam, uh, in Islam, that's not correct to make that adopted son as if uh, it is a regular son. For example, if a father, if a son marries uh, someone, uh, and the father can never marry that. Or if a father marries someone who's not the mother of the child, still that person can never marry that woman as well. They just become eternally. Uh, forbidden for them. But in the, in the people in that culture, in the time of the Prophet wasallam, they would apply the same rules to the adopted son. To which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet wasallam to take uh, the, uh, the wife of Zayd radiallahu anhu, his uh, adopted son, the, uh, as his wife. Zainab radiallahu anha and Aisha radiallahu anha even said that if there was an ayah that the Prophet wasallam would want to hide, he would have hid this ayah. Just because it's just completely breaking those uh, those uh, habits and those practices that they had, that everybody in the in the in this culture would be like, oh, what is he doing? But the Prophet sallallahu never disobeys Allah subhanahu wa taala, and in turn, it makes it easier for all those other believers who see the Prophet sallallahu doing it uh, something and knowing that okay, this is what we have to do, or this is permissible, or this is not permissible. Now, uh, the other thing also in uh, the surah that's uh, very beautifully put is um, the, one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ actually came to him and said, um, why are uh, all the uh, men mentioned in terms of what they do when they're uh, the men believers, the men uh, uh, who give sadaqah or those who believe? And all of it is used in the conjugation which applies only to men. But now it doesn't only apply to men, it calls out to that conjugation, but in Arabic linguistics it applies to both men and women. However, only the conjugation of the men is used majority of the time. So when she asked that, Allah SWT revealed this ayah calling out 
to both genders in each quality, in uh, submission, being Muslims, in belief, uh, being believers, in sadaqah, in uh, uh, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, calls out both the men and women, in the muslimina wal muslimat, wal mu'minina wal mu'minat, wal qanitina wal qanitat, all the way to the end of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to both genders. Now this could happen all throughout the Quran, but it will create some, some kind of redundancy because uh, the Quran is jawami al kalim, that it's uh, it's it's so, like so also one of the things that the qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had, but the, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are so deep that even a little that is said, a lot of meaning can be taken out of. So it's uh, that's why it doesn't say it every single time. But in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, specifically addressing to the question of uh, Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about her concern that why aren't women mentioned. So in this regard, it shows that no, there is no difference between gender here. It's it's both. It applies everywhere. Everybody who does a good deed, male or female, and in many places Allah SWT does uh, uh, call that to those genders. Whether you're male or you're female and you're a believer, then you get the rewards. So, but uh, uh, reading the ayah, I'm, I'm looking at it from a perspective of a woman like Umm Salama, she's reading it, uh, the Quran, and she's constantly reading that. So she decided to ask about it, and Allah subhanahu wa revealed this ayah for that concern to let everyone know and clarify that it has nothing to do with gender. You just have to do what Allah subhanahu wa asks of you. And for all of them, both male and female, Allah subhanahu wa says, He will forgive them and give them a great reward. So all the mistakes and the uh, shortcomings they had, they're forgiven for. And and they get a great reward, they'll be entered into paradise, regardless of their gender. Uh, so the, the other thing that where the surah ends with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, also calls the believers and tells them to stay, uh, say such steadfast good words. Uh, this is like the basics, one of the easy things that we could uh, start out. But when we're doing that, by we saying good words, uh, ultimately uh, your, your actions are supposed to start following your words. But... Uh, if we start saying bad words, then our action will start following those. So it starts with good words. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ends the surah by saying that you've been given a great um, amana, a trust. This is not an easy trust because the skies, the, uh, the mountains, the stars, they, they said we can't handle it. But we as human beings have been given that trust. And the thing about human beings is majority of them ignore and are ignorant of that trust. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is our responsibility. And uh, for those that are hypocrites or disbelievers or believers, they will take this trust differently. And because of that, the what they get back for it will also be different as well. And as we go from that surah to the next surah, surah al-Saba, uh, surah al-Saba and uh, surah Fatir, it starts with praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now surah al-Saba, it praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the fact that everything belongs to Allah. All that's in the sky, all that's in the earth, everything belongs to him. Almost connected to us, all the rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in, that, in the previous uh, surah, surah Ahzab that we just talked about. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kingdom. He's giving us those rules and he's giving us these rules not because it's going to make him or his kingdom stronger. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is letting us that, know that he is the most wise. Hakim al-Khabir. He's knowing, he knows what's good for you, and he's the most wise. That's why these rules are there for the individuals and for the communities and for society to better, better itself. Now, uh, what happened is when in Surah Saba, now two different people are going to be mentioned. First, Allah SWT speaks of those people that mock the Prophet ﷺ. They would say he's either a liar or he's uh, gone crazy. And instead of addressing his uh, the da'wah and the the claims of the Prophet ﷺ in a logical way, they, they rather took it as mockery. And they took mockery towards the Prophet Sallallahu and just calling him names. He's a liar. He's crazy. Uh, and um, just mocking the words that he said. Just repeating it in a mocking way. And you've seen people, sometimes they do it. Instead of when they have nothing to say, they just repeat your words in a very arrogant or mocking for mocking uh, way of... Uh, uh, they repeat the same words back in that same way that's, that's making you feel like, oh, well, well, why are you doing that? Why don't you debate with me? So then after saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives these two examples. He gives the example of Dawood alayhi salam and he gives the uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam and he gives the example of Saba. The tribe of Saba. Now Sulaiman alayhi salam and Dawood alayhi salam they were given many blessings. 
Dawud was a king. Sulaiman was given control over the wind. Jinns would be uh, his servants. And they had all this. But they were still able to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya'malu ala Dawud shukra. O family of Dawud, be grateful. Wa qalilun min amalbadi ashukur. And very few of my servants are grateful. And now when we talk about gratefulness, we sometimes think of, okay, I want this. Oh, I'm rich. I should be grateful. Oh, I'm healthy. I should be grateful. Oh, you know, I get this. I want this. I should be grateful. But there's a lot more to it. We should be grateful in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like in Surah Al-Ahzab, lets us know what is good for us. The fact that we pray, we should be grateful. The fact that we are able to, we have the Quran to recite, we should be grateful. The fact that now we're fasting in the month of Ramadan, all these commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are reasons to be grateful. There are many things that we want that is not good for us. And sometimes when we attain it, we see how we change for the worse. And there are many things that we don't really appreciate. But if we come to understand and do it correctly and see the results of it, we will actually be very grateful for those. And because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then uh, uh, tells the Prophet sallallahu in many different ways, go ask him logical questions. These things that you're ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what, did they create anything? Do they have any partners in the sky? Do they do anything? And in the same way, when you're bringing all these questions to them, look at the uh, subtle way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us to call others. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now you can say it the same way in different ways. For example, over here, what said is, you, you are not going to be asked about our sins. We are not going to be asked about your deeds. Do you see how when you're speaking, you speak in this kind, kind way where you don't put the blame on the listener and you put that on your own self to humble yourself and you let them know. Because if we constantly go and criticize and put down people who are listening, why would they listen to us? So just the word to say of the sins and mistakes that we've made and the deeds that you do lets them understand because they can apply both ways. Or, yeah, if this guy is saying that he sins, yeah, I probably sin. That will come in their minds. But it's not going to come from our tongues that we say, you're sinful, you're going to go to hell. Instead, we explain to them that there's sins that, uh, that exist, we're not going to be asked about each other's sins. There's deeds that we do, we're not going to be asked about each other's deeds. But you just don't apply to the listener, rather apply to one or uh, oneself. And ultimately, it continues back where uh, the disbelievers, they start to have an argument. Like if you don't figure out the reality in this world, uh, and they use mockery over here with the Prophet he's a liar, he's, a, he's crazy, and such words like this. Come day of judgment, now all of a sudden they're using logic against each other. Where one group will say, the group who were oppressed will say to those people who were in power, if it wasn't for you, we would have been Muslims. And in reality, that's the case. Because those people would constantly tell them, don't, listen, if, if something happens, we'll take care of it in the day of judgment. Don't do it, don't listen to our prophet, listen to us, we're your leaders, and such and such. But then on this time, now look at what the, what the leaders say. They say, look, we didn't force you. We told you, you followed us. So don't put it on us, it's on you. Whereas now, the people who were oppressed would come back to him and say, but day in, day out, every night you would tell us to and be persistent to tell us not to follow the Messenger Alayhi Wasallam. And because of that, now we're in the situation that we're in. But ultimately, the end result doesn't change. All of them, no one is going to be able to uh, benefit or harm the other person, as Allah SWT says at the end of the surah. Now, in Surah, uh, surah Fatir, uh, it's the same thing. It starts with another praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of how He created the skies, the earth, and the angels in different forms. And the same way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create whatever He wills. Now, as human beings, we should look at it and say that such beautiful creations, obedient creations like the angels were created, yet still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. And we see how human beings act on this world. So still it is a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we've been created. And now in the surah, not to make it longer than what it is already, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps 
telling us and reminding us of all the different favors that he's uh, that he's bestowed upon us and he calls us that uh, of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that that's out there no one's going to stop it from reaching you the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remember those blessings and in both surahs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets us know that there is this evil power which is the shaitan who's persistently trying to and consistently trying to uh, make us forget the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we shouldn't let those things distract us from the reality of it. Now, what's what we do want? We want uh, honor. We want power. And Allah says, do you want that honor? Where that honor all belongs to Allah. So, Go to Allah, you will get that honor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues by reminding us that, listen, in this whole scheme of everything that goes on in this world, there's one fact that you have to know. You are fuqara, you are needy, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghani. He's the one that's independent and he's the one that can fulfill every need that you have. So because of this, the believers understanding this, uh, the, their words on the day of judgment will be alhamdulillah. That they will praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. Whereas uh, the disbelievers, their words will be akhrijina. Like get us out of here. Go, we're going to go back. We'll do a good deed. We'll be grateful. But at that point, it's going to be of no avail. It's not going to help them in any bit. And uh, it's this time in this world that we have to be grateful for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, both in the commandments, uh, in the spiritual uh, world and uh, commandments, as well as this world. Every single blessing that we have, from a sip of water to something as high and noble as salah, we should be grateful for it. And it's a different... Uh, uh, you know, topic to just talk about gratefulness as well. But this is the general uh, top uh, topic that goes around in the 22nd years. Obviously, everyone should recite it uh, in depth by themselves, looking at the meaning of the ayats, asking different imams and scholars about certain words or certain concepts that they may not understand, so that we can really understand the true concept of gratefulness and also the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us these uh, commandments and how the positive effect that they would have on, in society and ourselves as individuals. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for all of our shortcomings. Jazakum Allah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.